Welcome to another episode of Two Fun Guys Talking Food Plots, a podcast dedicated to helping hunters grow better food plots with less work, less equipment, and better food choices, so landowners will have the most attractive food plots in their area that will hold deer and last longer into the hunting season. My name is Randy Vanderveen of Strategic Habitat, and my co-host is Brad Harper of Harper Growing Solutions, both based in West Michigan. In this episode, Brad and I talk about what we've been doing to help landowners build organic matter in poor soils with cover crops, how to better deal with weeds and grass in your food plots, different plot screen planting options, and what our preferred fruit tree for deer is in northern climates. So without further ado, let's jump into the call with Brad. So how are you doing this morning, Brad? I'm doing good. How are you? Real good. So we're getting in here to the dog days of summer getting into some heat and humidity looks like this week anyway what what are you uh what are you seeing from guys out there as far as uh food plot failures you got some guys that are getting flooded out and other guys that are getting droughted out as far as i see out there is that what you're seeing as well yeah exactly definitely depends on where you're at this summer there's a bunch of guys that just are absolutely begging for rain and then the other guys are wishing that it would stop yeah i've heard over Say in the uh, the eastern part of Michigan, uh, boy, some guys have just gotten you know almost an inch a day for like a week or two. You know, I mean, it's just off the charts. And then, yeah, other guys uh, like up in the Atlanta, Gaylord, Atlanta area, like through May and June, they just couldn't buy a drop of rain, and and now it's raining like crazy. So, uh, been an up and down summer. Absolutely, yeah, we're uh, we're in the same spot right now where. I think in the last seven weeks, we did get two inches, which was unreal for how the rest of the summer was going here, but we're just on the dry side here and you go 10 miles either way. And it's just a bunch of rain all over there. Yep. So uh, what kind of questions have you been seeing out there as far as uh, this time of year? Is there anything that uh, you see that seems to be a common theme right now at this time of year? Yeah, kind of everyone's going through and examining their summer plots, taking a look at how that went um, and deciding how they want to kind of move forward and definitely looking at the forecast, trying to figure that out. There's a lot of guys that had buckwheat failures. Um, We had some soil builder failures and it kind of depends on where you're at, obviously, but a lot of the times when we're trying to grow that buckwheat, a lot of guys, especially in a small plot to where we're having deer just hammering that buckwheat. So it's uh, having to take a different approach to try to build that soil or at least get a summer crop that we can start crimping into for fall. Yeah, I've had a client up in the UP and he had planted buckwheat for the first time. Um, didn't really realize that deer ate buckwheat, but, uh, <laughs> he went up there, <laughs> he went back up there, uh, I don't know, a week or two ago and says, man, it doesn't look like it's growing, you know? And, and I says, well, you know, maybe I ought to get some exclusion cages out there, you know, put a, put a trail camera out there. And sure enough, you know, yeah, he, he went and looked closer and a lot of the tops were just nipped right off. So it didn't look like it was growing, but the deer were just absolutely hammering it. So, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, those exclusion cages can really tell a big story. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that I see that is going to be really the answer for you. I get a lot of guys that will ask same thing. Hey, it doesn't really look like it's growing. Uh, what can I do? And without having either a camera and or a cage or both, there's a lot of things that we don't really know the answer to until we have all that information. So that is just a huge help for kind of going forward and trying to come up with a game plan. Yeah. And in case anybody doesn't know what an exclusion cage is, it's basically just a, a little wire fence. You know, it doesn't have to be very tall, even to a couple feet. You know, you put a couple stakes and get a little, you know, like chicken wire fence or whatever and put it around there so that the deer cannot get at you know, just a spot in the food plot. And it doesn't have to be very big, maybe, you know, a foot foot or two in diameter just to keep the deer out of it. And then that way you can compare the growth uh, between that spot and then where the deer are able to eat. And a lot of times it's very, very surprising. So. Yeah, that uh, I'm surprised. There's just a lot of areas where the deer just keep it so consistently mowed that you really wouldn't be able to tell um, just cause the whole plot's the same height. It's not like they're missing a single stalk anywhere. Yeah. And without that cage, it's really hard to tell exactly what's going on. And, or if you had a camera there, especially in clover, you know, clover is really something that it's kind of hard to see 
you know, the, the, the brows, like, unlike soybeans, it's easy to see, you know, the big leaves mm -hmm. are gone. Right. But anyway, they do work great. So have you been getting some, uh, some questions you've been seeing things on Facebook that, uh, might be on the top of people's mind right now, as far as, you know, uh, going no-till, how soil works. It seems like there's a lot of people that are really very interested nowadays in, in going no-till because they just don't have the time or equipment to do turning the soil over and that type of thing. Exactly. And there's been a lot of, I'm going to say no-till failures this spring that there's just a lot of information that, I mean, when you start that, that's a kind of a big deal and definitely a process. So I had a lot of phone calls and emails about um, guys that had winter rye growing and they went and tried to plant their summer crop in their rye. Um, there was a, a lot of issues that we had. I think the rye was just so thick and so tall that we were getting different timing on our germination rates. Um, you know, they had a little pop in here, a little pop in there. And especially when we have that in a high browse area, that that's going to be kind of hard to really grow a crop when you're only having a few plants germinating every few days rather than all at once. Um, we had a couple instances of that. And then a lot of times when we're doing no-till, the nitrogen factor can really kind of throw guys off to where we're putting all that carbon back in the dirt. And without the nitrogen to really help the biology along, that really t eats a lot of nitrogen that's in your soils and that's going to make it hard for it to grow. So especially when we're first starting to put a lot of green matter back in, we need to really remember to keep adding that nitrogen just to help all the biology along and, and help break that down. And, and Brad, would you say that that's probably one of the biggest reasons why some guys are out there saying that their buckwheat is pretty, is, is kind of a pale green or kind of a yellowish tint to it? Very well could be. Absolutely. I'm going to say there's some info out there that doesn't really explain well enough uh, about the no-till. And I think the nitrogen is probably one of the biggest. And when you're starting to put that down and have all that thatch there, that biology is just going to town. And if we're not feeding the soil correctly or giving it enough of what it needs in order to break that down, we're definitely going to have some deficiencies in the crop that we are trying to grow. So absolutely. So, so am I, if I'm hearing you right, you're saying that because we've got so much, you know, green manure, duff, whatever you want to call it, carbon going back into the soil that are, are you saying that that is a factor on depleting the soil out of its nitrogen because it's doing all that work? Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Basically the biology, it needs carbon and nitrogen in order to complete its life cycle. So we're putting the carbon to it and that's all decomposing, but we're still need to kind of keep up with that nitrogen while that process is taking place. And that's a thing that depending on soils and the crops we're growing, everything else, I mean, obviously there's going to be a different range for everybody of the amount that we're going to need, but that's something that we really need to keep up on as we're starting this process and as we continue to grow cover crops and put them back in the dirt, whether it's crimping or mowing, just anytime we have that thatch there, we need to kind of really think about that and, and kind of keep an eye on it. And your plants will definitely tell you what's going on. So that's something I, I'm getting pictures all the time. Hey, this is what it looks like. What, what's deficient? What can I do? You know, what's wrong? And I would say overall nitrogen is probably one of the bigger issues. Okay. Interesting. I, you know, I didn't know that. Basically, uh, you, you almost, it sounds to me like you almost need more nitrogen going no-till when you have a lot of, uh, you know, duff and carbon going back into the soil than if you were to, you know, disc and, and just broadcast, right? Yeah, because you're not having that, you know, decomposition taking place as much, I'm going to say, mm -hmm. to where we, it's not as big of a difference. You know, you can't just walk out there and see that visual difference now. It depends too on the crops big time and kind of your approach when guys are using granular, a lot of the times the mixes that they're throwing out have a ton of nitrogen. So that's something too, that you might not see that right away, but when we start to go with the, uh, you know, the carbon based uh, foliar or liquid products, that's one thing that depending on your process, that might be one issue that we need to kind of take a look at. Mm -hmm. you, you know, talking about going no-till and some guys having some frustration with no-till and you know one, one thing I learned early on when I started going down that no-till road was 
if I'm into a virgin field where, you know, it's just been CRP or maybe it's just been hay for many, many years, it's not been mm -hmm. turned over for a long time. You know, like you said, there's definitely a, a lot of mat, a lot of um, biomass laying there. And if you go to spray it with Roundup just to kill it all, kill all the competition and then start that no-till process, like you said, if, if there's too much duff on the ground, especially, you know, in a grassy situation, you know, it, it's that soil, uh, seed to soil contact that really is so important. And, you know, that very first year, it, it really does require, sometimes you just got to mow it right down almost to the dirt as low as you can go. Or, you know, maybe after, after mowing, if you got a lot of biomass laying on the top, you know, you'll, you just plain have to remove it somehow. And then maybe do a light disking, you know, just because that root system and, and the duff is just so thick that you're never going to get mm -hmm. that seed down to the soil, you know? Exactly. And that too, there's uh, a couple guys that trying to use the no-till drills and, you know, just broadcasting over all that thatch. I mean, that takes a minute to kind of get used to the rates and the settings on those planters and you know, the whole process, it just takes time to really get a good hold on it and really understand exactly how and when that that process is taking place. So I think that's definitely a, a good piece of advice to just stick with it. Don't give up. There's a lot of help out there. So, you yeah. know, if you, if you need it, get a hold of somebody. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of guys, they don't really want to deal with Roundup glyphosate and you know what, what are you seeing out there i mean there really isn't there's not a whole lot of alternatives i mean you're going to have to use some sort of herbicide especially you know in a virgin field you got a lot of competition um you know that vinegar and salt i mean it's really not it's it's a short-term option maybe <laughs> but it's really not something that's gonna take care of it like like something like glyphosate will so you know what, what kind of suggestions would you have for guys that don't like the gly um, I don't think there's really a good way to get around it. We have to take care of the weeds bottom line and other than trying to get into other herbicides that either a, you're going to need a license for, or B the, you're not going to like the price. There's just not really any getting away from using Gly. It, it's tough to do. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I know some guys, they don't use Gly and they just, they just till. You know, they, they do it, they, they kill everything mechanically just by mm -hmm. continuing to till or disc or that will work. But again, then you're, if you're in Northern Michigan and you're in sandy soils, you know, you're just constantly bringing up new sand all the time. You know, it's, it's kind of pick your poison, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's where I had a guy who we went kind of around, didn't want to use the glide. So we, we tried it. And after the first year, he just went back and said, that's fine. I'm going to use it because it, it was a headache and there was a lot of weeds. And like you say, if you start mechanically trying to take care of that, you're just constantly bringing up new weed seed. You know, you're having to then start dealing with uh, maybe compaction issue. It's just a lot of work to try to get away from that. And as long as you, you know, taking some good precautions with it, it's not that big a deal. You know, there's a lot of farmers that have been spraying that on top of a lot of other chemicals for a long time. And I think, uh, you know, the big media scare with that didn't really help. But mm -hmm. if you're taking precautions and, and kind of reading the label, following directions, I don't think there's an issue with that. Yeah. So, you know, last year, um, some guys might remember I posted a video about a, a food plot that it had, you know, had buckwheat in it, but it was overtaken with ragweed and foxtail and horse nettle and stuff was like six, seven feet tall. You literally couldn't even walk through it much less, you know, try and broadcast into that stuff. So, uh, you know, the landowner had lifted me up in a, in a, in like a utility box with his tractor and rode around the food plot while I was broadcasting with a hand spreader right into that stuff. And it, you know, we rolled it, then we sprayed it, you know, with herbicide. And then we put your liquid fertilizer and lime on it. And, you know, it turned out great. It was an awesome food plot. And so now fast forward to this year, you know, we had, uh, we had rye and crimson coming back. Um, we had just crimped that a little while ago. I just posted a video about that, but we crimped that rye. We didn't spray it, you know, because there really wasn't that many weeds in it going crimping the rye that we did and then planting buckwheat into it. 
uh, you know, that's going to give us two cycles of green manure this year into that uh, yeah. food plot. And it, it's pretty, it's a pretty sandy food plot. So, um, you know, man, you do that for a couple of years and not only will you, uh, you know, build up your organic matter, but, you know, between the buckwheat cycle and the, and the rye cycle, uh, you, you know, I, I really do believe that the, uh, the percentage of weeds is going to start to decrease, you know, coming right out of year one with that seven foot tall ragweed and stuff, you're not going to hit, you know, you're not going to hit a grand slam on year two. So, but, but I do think over a couple of years, you know, hopefully we may not even have to use, you know, glyphosate. Uh, and if we do, maybe just a light dose before we plant the fall food plots in August. I think guys are kind of getting sick of me saying it and talking about it, but I always talk about growing something that we can basically outcompete the weeds, you know, drown them out. Yep. And that's something to where when you're, especially when you're doing that, we're, we're basically running three crops a year. We got our spring rye, we got our summer plot, and then we got our fall plots. And by doing that, we're really cutting down the amount of weeds that are going to be growing in there. And especially when we're having a good nutrition program uh, right after planting that we can get those plants that we want off to a good start. Um, I think too, that's where nitrogen kind of comes into play to where if we can put a good fertilizer down without a lot of nitrogen, we're not feeding the weeds right away. That crop can come up and take off. I mean, we can add that nitrogen at a later date or come back with a foliar app and add the nitrogen then. I mean, there's a lot of options, but just by growing those crops consistently and always having something growing, you're going to really cut down on the amount of weeds in there, like you were saying. And and definitely by year two, three, I mean, it, it's a big difference. Yeah. I, I ran across somebody that's been, you know, going no-till now for, I think it's three to four years. And he was saying that earlier this spring, you know, when he was walking across that food plot, he noticed right away that it was like spongy. It was real soft because he had been doing two cycles of green manure every single year for like three, four years now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, boy, that's just a telltale sign that you know, he's probably got really good rain infiltration capabilities, you know, Absolutely. Cause, you know, he's got all these, uh, you know, little insect channels and root channels and all these lot of pore space right below the surface. And boy, exactly. when it rains, it's like a sponge. It just drinks up that water instead of running off, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's just another, a benefit by just sticking with it. If it doesn't work the first couple of years, you know, it's, it, you're, you're, you got good company really, because there's a lot of guys that struggle no till first couple, three years and, and, uh, it'll, it, it will get better from there. So. Absolutely. And I mean, even if there's failures, there's so many things that we can do to, you know, at least keep up on it without giving up. I mean, winter rye is just a perfect example that if all else fails, let's just hammer the rye. We can always frost seed perennials or clover and chicory. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of options to where, I mean, even oats in the summertime, mm -hmm. you know, we can really do a lot, even if the original plan doesn't work out like we wanted it to, there's always going to be a backup in order to keep up on that and keep going. Yeah. So, you know, I know of a couple of guys that have a, a real heavy clay type of soil. And, you know, a lot of the issues that I hear from, from them is that, you know, if they don't break up that soil, man, it just becomes concrete in the summertime. If there's any lack of rain Yep. and, you know, it's hard to grow soybeans in an environment like that, you know, so you have a product that, that it's a liquid and you spray it on, on a clay food plot and it tends to break or, or allow more water absorption. How does that work, Brad? Yeah, and that actually leads into one of the questions I just got on Facebook to where talking about calcium and magnesium, and that fits right in the same boat to where there's guys, um, actually one of the guys that you worked with, um, he's up north and he has lighter soils. And when he called me initially, he's like, well, I got some that's just pure sand and then I got some that's clay soils. So I, as I'm looking at his soil reports, I noticed that he really didn't have clay. He had high magnesium levels and that's where your soils are just really tight. And I mean, obviously there is clay here, but I see high magnesium quite a bit. And a lot of the times when it, you might get a quarter inch of rain, but it's just so slippery and sticky. You walk around and you got 10, 10 pounds of mud on your boots. And that's definitely one of the causes is going to be high magnesium. So 
I guess to kind of give a little description a minute, if you think like if you had two rocks or two chunks of two by four, and if those are your soil colloids, your soil particles, if you were to imagine like putting a pea in between them and crushing that pea to where, you know, you got good tension on it, think of that as magnesium trying to, you know, give you a visual description here. But if you were to think about that as magnesium, and then if you were to think about maybe an apple, now if you put them two rocks up against an apple, the amount of space you have between those two, that's going to be calcium. Your calcium is a whole lot bigger than magnesium. So when you have high magnesium, your soils are just really tight, hard to get good root growth. You don't get very much water penetration at all. It just kind of runs off. And then that's where we can add calcium in order to increase your micropore space. You're going to have better air and water movement. And that's really going to help you with root growth, you know, your nutrients as far as traveling through that micropore space. That's really going to help with water penetration and water holding capacity. So, so Brad, that goes back to your comment to me a while back where you always want to know what the CEC number is. Correct. Yep. It, that's going to tell me the type of soil. And then once we have that number, then we can start looking at the calcium and the calcium and magnesium, the base saturations in those ratios. And then that's going to tell me, okay, well, he might have a little heavier soil, but is it going to be high magnesium or not? And that's where having all those numbers in that sample is going to give us the best information as far as going forward with recommendation. So is there a, um, a certain ratio of calcium to magnesium that, that you want to see that you should shoot for? Yeah. I mean, really what we're shooting for calcium would be 65 to 75% in the base saturation in magnesium. We want to be below 18. Um, and if you start looking at samples, most samples are not within that window which that's fine. We, we got some work and that's not really terribly hard to work on, but that's definitely numbers to shoot for. And as soon as you start looking at those, I mean, there's magnesium levels that are up in 50s, 60s, 70s. And those are the same guys saying, well, I can't even go out there with a quarter inch of rain because everything's just super slippery. And that's to where depending on that CEC number, a lot of the times it is just high magnesium that's causing that. Hmm. And, and sometimes that might cause some guys to think they got a lot of clay. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Very interesting. Let's, uh, let's go back to that quick. When we're spraying Roundup glyphosate, uh, I always use a ammonium sulfate or ammonium sulfate replacement, um, whatever you can get near you. Normally both of them are pretty available, but by using that with your Roundup, that's going to help you to get a better kill. The plant is going to sense that there's nitrogen there and it's going to take it in a lot better. So then your roundup is your carrier. So you're going to get a lot better kill by doing that. And that's also going to help to where if you got harder to kill weeds, milkweed, thistle, you know, horse nettle, lamb's quarter. I mean, there's a lot of weeds that are tough to kill, but by having that AMS in there or the AMS replacement, that's going to do a lot better job on there and that's going to help you. So you're not really making roundup resistant weeds. Mm -hmm. That's, that's definitely a big one that the cost of that product is really not that much. And just to have that in the tank every time when we're spraying a herbicide, that's really going to help you out. Yeah. Um, I think it'll make your glyphosate go further. Exactly. And the same thing when it comes to, you know, using clethodim on our clovers, if by just by having that AMS replacement, Clothodim is a great product, but it really doesn't do a great job on quack grass, other certain types of grasses that especially when they get a little bit taller, cleth isn't really going to do a great job, but by having that in there, that's going to really help. Um, when I'm spraying clethodim too, I'm using uh, crop oil. If I'm going out by itself, that's just going to help you as well, having that edge of it in there. And, and crop oil, just for guys that don't know, what, what's the benefit of crop oil and what, why would you want to use that? Mainly that to simplify, that's just going to get you a lot better kill. That's going to really help to spread that, that Roundup out as that, well that, as the nitrogen. Is that for guys with hard water? No, that's not. Guys with really hard water, that's something that it, it doesn't hurt to get your water tested either, just so you know. But if you have hard water, you're going to want to look for a buffering agent 
to get that pH down. The farther you get your pH down, the better Roundup is going to work. But that's to where you'll have a like a buffering agent. Um, a lot of those products are buffers and water conditioning agents. So that would be that would go under surfactants. Mm-hmm. Um, so by having that, yeah, that will help condition your water and just help you get a better kill. So all those things are definitely big deals when it comes to hard to kill weeds. I got some clients that are way up north, like UP and northern uh, Wisconsin. They got a lot of sedge, like nut sedge, yep. Pennsylvania sedge. That stuff is nasty to kill. Um, what what yes. what's worked for you on that type of thing? Um, there's a product called Sedge Hammer, and that's going to be pretty available one. I've seen that in uh, in some big box stores, I believe. TSC okay. maybe. Not it could be. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, there's a couple other things we can do in which I don't know off the top of my head if they were restricted or not. Permit is one that's going to give you a uh, really good control of that. Um, I, th- I would say the biggest thing though, is we got to make sure we're not letting that go to seed and that we're hitting it early. The later the, uh, that we let that go, the harder it's going to be to kill. So that might be something that we might have to sacrifice, you know, even if it's just the spot spray, but you might have to sacrifice that little portion of food plot just to make sure we can try to get that under control and hitting it early is definitely going to help along with adding those uh, adjuvants and surfactants to get you a better kill. Yeah. You know, some of the sed, um, nuts edge and, and Pennsylvania sedge that I've seen is actually out in the woods. I mean, and that, that woods looks like a carpet of green out there. You know, it's just uh, almost like, you know, basically in park effect areas where, you know, there's a high overhead canopy Mm -hmm. and there's nothing growing, but, but nuts edge. And, uh, you know, guys think it's grass and they'll go out there with clethodim, but clethodim won't even touch it. So, uh, you know, for those guys that think that, uh, they have grass in their woods, it might be a sedge. And like you said, sedge hammer permit that might, that might do it. And sometimes it's just a matter of, uh, getting a tank sprayer on the back of an ATV and driving through your woods. If you have, uh, you know, not a boom sprayer, but, uh, you know, just a pressurized where, you know, it's just a single, single nozzle and just sprays out into a fan. That's probably the way to do that. So yeah, spot spraying can go a long ways when we have a lot of hard to kill things like that to where it's definitely worth taking the time, you know, maybe sacrificing that little spot of food plot, or even if it's in your screen, I mean, getting those under control in the long run is going to, going to make a big deal. Yep. So, um, what, what have you seen so far this year from guys planting uh, plot screen, you know, sorghum, miscanthus grass, that type of thing. I mean, it seems like the, uh, you know, the spring was really warming up early this year and then it just kind of leveled out and actually was, was kind of a cool, you know, April and, and seemed like, soil temperatures didn't rise, you know, like we all thought they were in March when it was really warm. So have you seen, um, plot screen failure this year very much? Yeah, I've definitely seen a few. And, um, I just had a guy yesterday who was saying that they did it twice and they had two failures Whoa. and that was early June. And that was the first thing I asked and they, they weren't sure on the, the ground temp. And I think that that's one that that's probably the biggest deal that guys are just chomping at the bit to get it in so early um, that as long as we're following directions, keep an eye on that ground temp. And when it comes to that later is, is, is definitely going to be better than t- taking a risk early. I just finally planted my screen yesterday. No, the day before. So two days ago, I finally just got mine in now. And that's something that depending on the height you need, that's not a bad thing. You know, I need six, eight feet and I know I can get that. Not a problem. Yep. obviously hoping for some rain, but planning this late with your screen, depending on your height, it, it's not that big of a deal. Cause we know for sure, without even have to do any research, we know that those soil temps are obviously plenty good now, but it's, it's definitely going to be really close and touchy when we try to get it in, you know, that early, uh, if that ground temps up or not. Yeah. And the temperature we're looking for is about 50 degrees soil temperature, right? Oh, shoot. No, we want it a lot higher. 65 degrees really yep 65 degrees okay yeah in in which like on the ag side we talk about um kind of watching your inputs until the ground's 55 that's when all your bacteria starts going and that's when you'll really start to see things you know ready to rock 
so 65 that's something that this year especially we had nine days of frost in a row late may um, we had another frost at least most of northern michigan got really close the uh, middle of june there so that's something to definitely keep an eye on and i'm going to say that was probably the issue for a lot of those uh screen failures okay so for the guys that don't want to mess around planting annual plot screen sorghum every year you know miscanthus is is a great option as long as you're not too far up in that uh, growing zone you know up in the extreme northern climates what's your feeling about that i mean how how far north are you willing to go with with uh, miscanthus i would say we can we can definitely do very well um i got a guy who's even up by the bridge and so far everything's working out great now the one thing to remember too again is your height the farther we go north yeah we're not going to be able to get the 10 12 foot miscanthus absolutely but depending on where you're at a lot of the times we do only need that six or eight feet and that's going to be fine switchgrass being another good perennial uh that we can definitely work with as far as screening goes and a lot of the times what guys are doing is they're planting miscanthus and switch and we're using that annual screen for the first three, four, maybe five years as that's getting going. And that's a great option too. You know, that's probably just the, the thing that I hear the most is that um, they want to be plan it once and be done. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely doable. But in the meantime, we still would want to run that annual just so we have a screen in the, if for the time being. Some guys are, you know, planting their annual for the first two, three years in one strip, and then they'll put the, uh, you know, the, the switch grass say in front of it or behind it, you know, and then when it gets tall enough, they just eliminate the, uh, the, the annual yard. Right? But, um, you know, my buddy, Jake, uh, you know, Jake, he's, he tried it in the same strip and, uh, he, he actually came out with a video on his process on planting, you know, sorghum and switchgrass in the same spot and uh, actually worked out really well. And to me, it almost looked like the, uh, the switchgrass actually did better because the sorghum act as a nurse crop for the switch. And uh, he's really happy with the results on that. So if anybody, uh, you know, Jake Ailey or at Habitat Solutions 360, he's got a great video on the process of how we did that and worked out great. Yeah, I was lucky enough to go down there and, and see that this year. And that's something I was going to do that in a few spots just to, you know, kind of try it and showcase that a little more because that's an awesome way to do that to where, especially like if you take, let's say, 15 feet wide to plant your annual, we can run a five or six, maybe even 10 foot strip of switch that first year. And then that still gives you that five foot you can keep running that annual until that switch is mature and mm -hmm. that's going to be an awesome way to do it while you know without taking up a ton more room when it comes to you know kind of how, deciding how much to to screen how much do we leave in our food plot if we can take 15 feet do that that's a good way to go yeah so i gotta ask you brad first time on jake's property what'd you think it was unreal <laughs> It was funny because we were walking around and we got all done and he's kind of asking me, you know, how much ground do you think we covered? And I'm thinking uh, 40, 45, and it was 20. Oh, wow. Yeah. Isn't that it something? Was, it is awesome. Um, yeah. That really, I mean, you know, you, you start doing the research and talking to guys and we know that we can make a difference, but when you actually see that, you're like, wow, okay, well, that gives me hope, you know, like, especially at my house where I only have 20. It's like, yeah, you don't need a ton of ground in order to make that happen. Right. Um, once you kind of start implementing those plans like that. Yep. So did he take you through any of his uh, wooded, uh, like hinge cut areas and bedding areas and whatnot? Yeah. Yeah. I got to see uh, quite a bit of it. And that's where we were, because um, I brought him all that stuff for the liquid lime and the liquid fertilizers. And he was going to be running that and running some trials. So we went and looked at all the food plots and kind of talking about a, coming up with a game plan and just it was unbelievable yeah seeing is believing that's right so um but, uh you got miscanthus plants available yet I, I hear some some people are having a tough time trying to find some um some guys were like out um what what do you have available brand yeah i still have some um i have all the bare root you know the the rhizomes in the spring and then i always have 
a bunch of one, maybe two gallon pots, depending on the year or, you know, what's left. And right now I do have a lot of one gallon pots left. Um, I think that's going to really transition us to the next spot, talking about uh, fall planting of trees and, and miscanthus to where if you're sandy and you're buying, you know, the bare root, the seedlings and putting in rhizomes of miscanthus in the spring, in a sandy setting like that, that's very tough to where if you have any amount of drought, we're really going to lose a lot. So that's kind of why I switched over to more of a fall planting. It works out really well. I kind of plan on planting all my trees when I'm in there layering my rye. And -hmm. it doesn't really take too much extra time to where I can still get in and out fairly decent. But just the fall planting of those to where we can acclimate with the fall rains and the winter and the spring, spring rains. So rather than having to worry about that drought right away, we can actually, you know, get that plant acclimated and all settled in, ready to go. So therefore, the first summer, now not only are you planting a plant with a bigger root system, but that thing's ready to go that first summer. Yeah. And the success rates, I would say, for sure doubled to where all my plantings, I'm at about 90%. I'm keeping keep playing with root dips and, you know, different inputs we can do on that. and. 90%. That's a, that's a big deal. When you look at planting all those seedlings, well, the trees themselves are very cheap, but by the time you figure out, okay, how much money did I spend and how many trees are alive after one year, it might be something to think about doing more of a fall planting with a bigger root system, kind of thinking quantity or quality over quantity at that point in time. Yeah. You know, I, I've always thought that uh, labor day was always kind of a, a target date for me to, to get the trees in. And mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're past that, um, the dog days of summer and yep. you know, the, the nights are getting longer, uh, and cooler and, you know, we, we generally get a few more rains, uh, in September. I always thought that, uh, you know, planting trees and around labor day, it was always a great option. And that way, you know, when you do finally get into the, uh, a hot, dry summer, you know, that's like, you know, 10, 10, 11 months after you planted. So, you know, the trees are much more established. And I just think, uh, success rate is, is much higher than trying to plant in the spring. Absolutely. I mean, it's a big deal. Um, and that's that too, like, especially with the miscanthus to where if it's sandy at all and planting that little rhizome starting from scratch, it's tough. I mean, I had a lot of guys this year cause we were, we were very dry, you know, all the way up until that was just a couple of weeks ago when we kind of had all them storms go through that, that was the first good amount of rain that a lot of guys had gotten. So when they went out and, you know, they planted 500 rhizomes or a thousand or however many that the success rate was very poor just because we weren't getting any rain. So Mm -hmm. if you were to take that same amount of money and put it into potted plants, I mean, your success rate is going to be night and day. Yeah. So on the, on the type of fruit trees that you have, um, you have any of the uh, crab apples, Brad? Yes, I do. I'm running the same varieties that all the farmers are running so we're, it's all commercial varieties on commercial rootstocks and that's going to give us a lot better confidence as far as making it through the winter having fruit and being able to adjust to you know especially where we're at here that a lot of the southern varieties that you can get at the box stores they look nice but then half the time if we get a hard winter or something and that tree doesn't come out of it well the, a lot of people aren't too happy when that happens mm-hmm now I find though that uh, crab apples are much more winter hardy than you mm-hmm. know your conventional big apple trees. You know I, I think they produce fruit earlier in its life cycle, a lot more fruit than than, than you will a typical traditional apple. Is that mm-hmm. that been your experience as well? Yes and no. Definitely depends on the variety of the crab. Now a lot of the farmers are using Manchurian crabs, and that gives you. Uh, I mean, it's a pretty decent sized crab apple yet. And a lot of the times they're saying that the deer do actually start hammering those over some of the other actual commercial varieties, which is really nice because not only can we utilize that as a pollinator, but you're also getting, you know, fruit off of that. Mm -hmm. Um, And by having those, we were just talking about the the other day with looking at harvest dates and how to plan your fruit tree plantings. And one thing to think about too, is those dates, that's actual harvest. So if we're not harvesting, we're letting those tree, the apples fall off the trees naturally, we can easily add three or four weeks onto that to where we're getting trees that are dropping in December yet. Not a problem. Mm. And a crab is a great one for that, that it just kind of slowly starts dropping, 
you know, earlier, but then it's, it's able to hang on to quite a bit of fruit throughout the whole season, which is really what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Crabs, they do actually have, there's a lot of different varieties out there, man. I'll bet you there's probably a good, uh, 20, 25 different varieties available on crabs, you know, from early season, all season, late season, it's mm -hmm. pretty amazing. So exactly. Yeah. I've already seen the first post out on Facebook now about a guy wondering if it's too late to plant his food plots. Did you see that? Yeah, I did see that. <laughs> so generally, you know, when you're planting brassicas, you know, this is about the time you want to start thinking about, you know, putting your, getting your brassicas in maybe another two, three weeks, start thinking about getting your grains in even after labor day. I mean, you can still, you can still plant a fall food plot, you know, especially like, uh, you know, rye grains, some of these, uh, more cold tolerant, uh, you know, seeds, but, um, yeah, definitely not too late to start you know, planting a food plot, but you know, the prep process, yeah, we got to get after it. If, if you haven't started that yet, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And that's where definitely depending on where you're at North to South, I mean, the guys up North, Northern Michigan, UP kind of looking at that, that's something, yeah, we want to start looking at getting our brassicas in very shortly here you know, just to make sure we have at least four weeks before that first frost date. And, you know, as you come south, we can get closer and closer to Labor Day. Even if you happen to miss the boat, we can always plant some grains um, Labor Day, even into September and not have an issue. So definitely time to start at least getting the prep work ready and, and done. Um, but there's plenty of time yet. Yep. Yep, exactly. So anyway, um, are, are you starting to ship out a lot of lime and fertilizer and foliar and all that stuff right now, Brad. Absolutely. And, uh, it never really stopped this year, just the, especially with the failures to where, you know, they're trying the same stuff over and over and nothing's working. And then they wanted to, okay, well, let's try something different. So I was working with guys that were just switching from granular, um, especially after, you know, maybe a failed buckwheat planting to say, okay, well, let's start with a foliar application on that get some soil samples coming and then we'll take a look at putting, you know, a full program together for you in the fall. And it's just nice having that flexibility of the foliar, regardless of where your soil's at, we can still make a big difference with that application because we're just going in through the leaves. So even if, you know, your pH isn't quite right, because maybe you put ag lime on just a couple months ago, or just recently, we can still go in with a foliar application and still make a good, good input and at least get that crop going for now and then take a look at amending the soil later. I mean, we always have that option. And that's where that's kind of been the, what's been happening the last three, four weeks, as far as, you know, where I'm at and what I've been doing. It uh, reminds me of something that um, got a client who had, you know, some really poor soils and he's got the ability to, to have a lime truck come in, or, you know, he can even do pelletize if he wanted to, but that's, you know, a lot of bags, a lot of money. His question was, and I'm sure he's not the only person that asks this question. So there's probably a lot of other guys out there listening to this that are wondering, but you know, he wanted to know if he could put ag lime down, you know, like right now, and it's going to take a while for the pH needle to get moved on that ag lime. But then he was wondering if he, if it'd be a good idea then to also follow up at planting time here next month with the, uh, with the liquid lime. So he'll have the long-term benefit of the egg and the short-term benefit at planting with the liquid. What, what's your, what's your thought about that? Yeah. I mean, that's absolutely, that's a great scenario. There's a lot of guys that are using liquid, but they're still keeping up on their ag lime to where they might not do as much of either or, or both products because they're using them together. But that's where, I mean, you put ag lime down, it's going to be a while before that actually starts to react in the soil and, and make that change. So we can definitely do that and help out with that to where a lot of the times too, it's all based on your schedule to where you might want to get your ag lime out in the spring and sometimes weather schedule, it doesn't happen. Well, that's not a problem. We can still put that ag lime out whenever you can, and we can just still supplement with the liquid in order to get that change to still grow a crop this year. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So for the guys that want to go no-till and they put ag lime down, um, are you recommending that they do lightly disc it in? Or do you feel that just by, you know, over time that ag lime will incorporate into the soil without disking it in? Unfortunately, you'd probably want to do something in order to incorporate that in. Just because of the bigger particle size of that product, 
it's not going to give you the most benefit if you don't. Yeah. I think that's where the liquid lime as well, being such a small particle size really wins because we can go in there and make that change right away just by spraying it on. And we don't have to worry about that. That's definitely a big benefit there. Yeah. Agree. So, um, is there anything else that, uh, you, you'd want to just, uh, share with everybody as far as, you know, maybe timely things that they need to be doing right now before we close this out? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, definitely start thinking about prepping for everything and, and getting your seed on hand, having your fertilizers and coming up with a game plan because depending on the situation, some guys, it's only going to be, you know, two weekends to where they might only be able to have one trip up to their property and it's go time. So definitely start getting that going, get out and at least get your herbicides on now um, and taking a look at, you know, having everything on hand, ready to rock. It's definitely that time. I know everyone's getting excited. Yeah. It's, it's not any fun when, uh, you know, Oh, I'm going to be planting next week and I better go out and buy my stuff. And, uh, you know, huh, this guy's out, that guy's out or, you know, shipment show up late and, you know, you miss your planting window. So, yep. No better time to get uh, prepared for that than now. So, all right, Brad. Well, Hey, uh, good catching up with you again. I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll be in touch here shortly again. Um, I've got a few soil samples, uh, that I'll need to be, uh, sending your way before you know it, it'll be, uh, time to get the seed in the ground and put the cages up and, uh, time to get them broadheads, uh, shall sharpen up as well. Yeah, it is. And, uh, I'm getting excited. I know, um, we had a somewhat cool night, I guess you can call it that, but it was down in the fifties. And then every time we start to get those, you really get excited and it's coming. Yep. Can't wait. All right, Brad. Well, Hey, we'll catch yep. up with you again next time. And, um, hopefully we'll not wait as long next time. No, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's something too. We can take a look at doing one in just a little while, especially when we're talking about the foliar applications. Um, guys are looking at planting brassicas and then all of a sudden they're, they're purple just a couple weeks later and wondering what's going on. Well, we can definitely come in with that foliar and make a change. So that's something that we could definitely cover here coming up shortly. Yep. All right, Brad, sounds good. So for, for any guys that want to get a hold of you, you know, about, uh, you know, any, liquid lime fertilizer products, or maybe even some of your miscanthus or, or fruit trees. Um, I'll put your email in the uh, description box below along with your phone number. So guys want to just look Perfect. below the video, they can get your contact information right there. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'm on Facebook and Instagram and you can look at my website, just type it into Google. It's Harper growing solutions. Um, I'm on all those platforms. So definitely if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get a hold of me. Sounds good, Brad. All right. We'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks. You bet. See ya.